Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, so now we definitely increase the level of interaction. So the objective of this lecture is um, that you do something yourself and therefore uh, before I start I have to know uh, who has a laptop. Well, there are many. And uh, who are able to, uh, who is able to calculate things on this laptop? <laughs> That's good. Because, because part, part of the focus of the entire training school is that we somehow operationalize our knowledge. So not only listening uh, to uh, what kind of fancy formulas we are able to produce on a PowerPoint slide, but we want to operationalize it. And that's the reason we start uh, with a very, very straightforward example. Uh, it's actually an example on uh, structural optimization. So this already contains this risk aspect we are heading to. Uh, but we also do this uh, structural optimization uh, conditional to data we observe uh, in tests, right? And uh, the example we set out is as simple as you can imagine. It's a simple supported beam uh, from a, from a, a very uh, uh, conven conventional material. It's just steel. It's a steel beam. And by the optimal design of this beam, we uh, somehow go through all the different steps uh, from a formal decision uh, analysis. So that's the, that's the idea. So the idea is then uh, after I have presented something for like a quarter of an hour, you already have enough information that you can make your first calculations. And of course, I assume that the level of uh, background or background in uh, somehow fulfilling this specific task is maybe a little bit varied among you. So therefore, it's maybe also an idea that we build groups about uh, four people on one computer, three to four people, and uh, try to implement these things uh, in groups. And I will not uh, give you any advice which program you, knew you use, which tool you use on your laptop to calculate these things. Uh, but uh, the results we ha or I have produced, I did in, in MATLAB. But this is very compatible with, uh, for instance, Python. Uh, in this uh, example, you can even uh, calculate also with Excel if you want. Uh, so it's uh, possible to calculate uh, just with some uh, program you have on your, on your laptop. But before we start, uh, I want to um, make the big round uh, on uh, what we are doing as uh, engineers. So I suppose we are all a kind of engineers here also uh, to kind of welcome you. Very nice picture of a, of a European city. Guess where it is? Eh? Oslo. Oslo. You see here the uh, Osra, Oslo Opera House. Uh, here you see the, uh, the, the main uh, the city building. Well, it's a very nice uh, city, but what we see mainly, the message here is we see the built environment. The built environment contains infrastructural elements, uh, buildings for offices, housing, cultural events, uh, under the earth there's also all kinds of infrastructure you can imagine. So this is uh, just an example of a piece of the built environment that is actually built to support our societal activities. But what you also see is uh, you see many beams, you see many slabs, you see many columns, you see many structural parts. We as structural engineers normally uh, like to address our uh, problem settings too, right? So this is actually a, a cohort of thousands of millions of uh, structural components, right? And these structural components, they are somehow managed, they are somehow designed and uh, developed following some rules. And when we develop this uh, infrastructure, when we develop the structure behind this built environment, uh, we uh, follow a certain strategy. So what is the strategy we follow? So the components, they have to be safe enough. They should not consume too much uh, resources. Uh, and they should be somehow uh, developed in a context of uh, economical growth. So it should be also uh, somehow cost efficient to develop them. 
And uh, when we make a decision on such a component, and we will have such a principal decision on a structural component, we have to follow and incorporate such a strategy in a kind of a logic. And to make a long story short, we go to this picture again. You had it already from uh, Sebastian. But uh, what, is, what is so nice and what is so beautiful on this uh, concept? It's, uh, of course, the, Bayesian, uh, the principle of the Bayesian decision analysis. We have here the a priori analysis, the a posteriori analysis, and the pre posteriori analysis. Uh, Sebastian talked uh, extensively about that already. But what, what is the quality of this? Why, why do we follow this? What is the basic attribute of such a framework? You can make decisions, you can make, you can somehow structure your decisions. Maximize the you maximize the benefit, exactly. So you maximize some utility. So you define a utility for somebody and you have a rational framework in order to attain uh, this utility, right? And uh, what I just said is rationality, this is actually something important. What does rationality mean? In our context, there are many, many uh, def definitions. And then I now come up with some uh, possibility. We can have a five-hour discussion of uh, whether it's worthwhile to discuss differently. But rationality can be seen as setting up consistency between our beliefs and our reason to believe and our action and our reason to act. These two, these two sentences, they are very heavy. Right? So you can, you can digest them a little bit. But when we, when we just use these principles and we seek for a, a strategy, for a concept, for a framework that somehow brings us close to this kind of rationality, then maybe we end up in a Bayesian decision analysis. To go even further, when we talk about reason and, uh, and uh, our, our strategy to reason, we might also bring this back to some basic questions an uh, old uh, German philosopher once asked when he was actually thinking about pure reason. And he was asking, uh, what should I do? What may I hope? What may I hope? And what can I know? And these three questions, they are all included here, right? So it's what should I do? This is about the action. What may I hope? It's about the utility. And what can I know? That's actually the interesting one, right? And that's the one we address uh, in this training stool. So it's the exploration of do we know enough to make this decision? It's the exploration of, uh, did we set up our model complex enough to give a sensible answer uh, to our decision problem? And when we have opened up uh, the Bayesian decision problem uh, in a way that we also seek for an uh, optimal choice of representation, it's actually referred to that, how can we represent our problem optimally? Thinking about some resources, resources a complex modeling might uh, consume, and thinking about the possible benefits this increase of complexity might give. And then we come very, very close to a situation where we might argue, this is just the best we can do. And this is something we need as engineers, especially in critical situations, in critical decision situations. Sebastian already mentioned that we have to be careful with such a technocratic framework because the outcome of such a framework can be totally misleading. But as long as we are critical enough and explore this direction of this decision tree of what can we know and try to represent the best practice that is somehow inherent to our engineering community, and then we might argue that this is just the best we can do. Right? And that's really a beautiful uh, aspect of this concept, even so the decision tree looks somehow simple. Uh, in realistic problems, it does not look so simple anymore, right? Uh, but now let's keep it as simple as it is, and let's look as a, at a, a 
decision problem that is maybe the most basic decision problem we know in uh, structural engineering. It's a decision problem of the optimal design uh, or optimal choice of cross section of a structural element. And then we look at how information might somehow uh, affect this optimal decision. So information is, a, is an important part of this uh, decision making. And before I come uh, to the example, I just want to highlight and maybe also come back to a discussion we had before uh, uh, about uh, the indicators. Uh, when, we, when we look at information, uh, it's always uh, uh, useful to think about what kind of information do I have, right? So first of all, we can uh, distinguish between uh, direct information and indirect information. So this is already uh, a critical distinction that is closely related to the discussion about the indicators we had, right? So direct information is uh, information about a variable that is directly part of my model that uh, uh, represents an event that leads to consequences. Indirect information is uh, observation on a variable that informs me about the variable that is directly included in this model. So an example is um, when we are interested in, a, in a, a failure event, then we might be interested in a load bearing capacity, right? And when we make measurements on the load bearing capacity of this material, then this, this can be seen as direct information on the load bearing capacity, right? But we might also uh, look at uh, a similar, or we might look at structural elements and only measure the stiffness. And we know that the stiffness is somehow uh, correlated uh, to the ultimate capacity. So this would be indirect information about the ultimate capacity. So when we get information about the stiffness, we have indirect information also about the ultimate capacity. And then here we distinguish between equality type information. This is when we get exactly an observation on a value. And inequality type information, this is the information that we know that the value is larger than a certain threshold or the value is smaller than a certain threshold. This is also uh, very often the case, right? We very often have uh, such kind of uh, informations. And uh, inequality information is, for instance, also when we have a structure that is already installed and we observe that this structure survived a certain loading referred to as uh, proof load. And then we know that the structural resistance of this structural part is larger than the load effect induced by this proof load. So this is also a kind of inequality information. And of course, uh, we can use this kind of information in order to learn more about uh, the representation of the events that lead to consequences. And in our context, now in this context of this lecture, this is just failure, right? So let's uh, get started with this uh, problem and uh, you will type into your computer and calculate in uh, just uh, uh, some minutes. So we consider a steel beam bridge uh, with a span of 20 meters. So it's the most simple uh, um, structural system you can imagine. It's a simple supported beam. And uh, the beam is exposed uh, to a load effect. I'm sorry for the for the misprint here, it's the load effect Q uh, that is already given in a moment unit, right? It's the kilonewton uh, times meter. So that's the load effect on this beam, right? And as we have steel, uh, we uh, think about uh, um, uh, section modulus. We want to have this beam uh, to, to have in order to somehow uh, minimize uh, the expected costs uh, that are associated uh, to this beam. So we assume that the steel yield strength and the uh, uh, load effect are represented as uh, normal distributed random variables. This is a very, very simple uh, assumption, but that makes the calculation a little bit faster we want to do. And we consider Q representing a 50 year maximum distribution of load effect. Huh? So, 
We have uh, some parameters given for the normal distribution. So we have uh, the steel uh, yield capacity and we have uh, Q and we have some costs. For instance, we have some costs for the steel uh, or we have some other variables than costs also. We have the span uh, of 20 meters. Uh, we have some fixed construction costs and we have some variable construction costs or we have some variable construction coefficient that is multiplied uh, to the choice of W. And then we have the direct costs of failure. Oh, it should be the indirect costs of failure H, uh, which is uh, expressed as, uh, uh, as a function of the uh, fixed construction cost. So this is now uh, many, many assumptions and you don't know, of course, how to put them in your example. But first, uh, I give you some hints then. First, uh, we look at uh, the three tasks uh, we have to do. So the first task is we should find the uh, optimal choice of W, section modulus. Uh, the second task is uh, after we have, have, have observed some data on the yield capacity, what would be the optimal choice then? And the third task is how many experiments future experiments where we don't know the outcome, but how many experiments should I do, given the experiments have some costs? Right? And uh, I hope most of you see that this is already uh, the onset of uh, Bayesian decision analysis from all three different perspectives. So we have a prior analysis here, we have a posterior analysis here, and we have a pre-posterior analysis here. And we use uh, data, we use a normal distribution, we use some uh, very, very uh, simplifying assumptions considering this, is, this distribution and our knowledge about the distribution. Uh, and in real problems or in more advanced problems, this gets much more complicated, everything. Uh, but by having this example, we have everything on the table. We have done the entire analysis and maybe we also get a feeling on our fingertips uh, what this analysis, analysis is about. Right? So let's get started with the a, with a first task and some additional information. So first, uh, maybe I should mention that we, uh, because I don't know what your particular background is, but I assume that you are able to uh, calculate a failure probability based on two normal distributions, right? So when we, when we look at the, at the limit state function, defining failure, we have the limit state function as a function of R and S, and we might define this as W times R, my, uh, it's of course Q, I'm sorry, minus Q. So that's the limit state function. We have two random variables, R and Q, they are normally distributed, and that allows us to uh, evaluate the uh, beta index, right? And we are able to express this beta index as a function of W. So I leave it to your groups of three or four to uh, remember the, the equation for the beta index, but what we want to have is uh, beta index as a function of W and also a probability of failure as a function of W. Right? So this is something we, we, we have to establish. And as we uh, see, this functional relationship between the decision variable in such a structural optimization example and the probability of failure is actually the only information we, we need to have. Huh? And this functional relationship between the failure probability on the decision variable uh, uh, W goes in into this uh, objective function. So the objective function, in, uh, in very simple terms, is the, is the uh, expected total cost as a function of W, which we want to represent as a construction cost as a function of W, and the expected ultimate failure cost as a function of W. So here 
the construction costs are, uh, are split it up in a fixed construction cost. So this is, uh, these are the construction costs you always have, independent of the choice of W. You can imagine, in a practical example, you have some cost components that not directly depend on your choice of uh, W, right? For instance, you have to transport the beam to the construction site and things like that. You have to employ some workers to install the beam. So this all goes into the uh, cost independent of the choice of W, this is C0. And then we have a cost that is uh, directly proportional, that's also our assumption, directly proportional to the choice of W, and that's the C1. So the construction cost is a direct function of the choice of uh, W. And uh, then we have the failure cost, and the failure cost are the construction cost, because we consider that when the structure has failed, we want to rebuild it, because the uh, societal need uh, for the activity that is supported by the structure will remain, even so if we have a failure, so we have to reconstruct it. And then we have this H, this is the indirect failure cost, this is all the cost uh, that comes up on top to the reconstruction cost. You can imagine when you have a failure, then you might have uh, some damage of installations, you have some property uh, damaged, you might even have some uh, fatalities, that all goes into H. And of course, we want to have the expectation, so we multiply uh, the failure cost, the cost for given failure, uh, we multiply by the probability of failure. And the probability of failure, as we, uh, as we see here, is of course a function of W. As bigger this uh, W gets, as lower the probability of failure gets. Right? So we have this functional relationship between W and the uh, probability of failure. And then, of course, when you have uh, this uh, objective function, then uh, we want to find the minimum. So this is now uh, also a super simplification to a full Bayesian uh, decision analysis where we might have a very complex uh, formulation of a utility. So here we just look at the expected cost and our utility is somehow uh, to, or our objective is to minimize this expected cost. So we want to minimize this. By changing W, we want to find uh, the minimum of the expected total uh, consequences. So this for task number one, this uh, information uh, should be uh, enough, uh, together with the, with the values on the two tables on the slide before. So now uh, I ask you to find some colleagues, maybe the colleagues you already sit uh, together on the table and implement this example. And find the optimum estimation, estimated uh, working time is 15 to 30 minutes. Can you show the previous slide? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> have, you, have, you received, have you received the document from the file share? So no, right no, okay. So I, I, I swap uh, between these two slides and then you can, you can also make your notes, right? But do you have any questions to get started? Yes. Yeah, that comes out from this optimization, right? The optimization. Yeah, that's actually the the little bit uh, the the sense of this exercise yeah. is that uh, the absolute value of the probability of failure only is a side product of the entire analysis. So we are mainly interested in the minimization of the costs. But then when we have the results, we might discuss about uh, the absolute value uh, a little bit further and how this could be treated in a, in a real project. So concentrate on this uh, objective function and uh, on the, the values here on that slide. Any more questions in order to get started? Maybe I have overseen some basic information, or is it clear? It's a beam, we don't have to care about the statics, right? Because we directly have given the load effect. So this is already uh, the load effect. And this is then just something we multiply to, uh, to the resistance. <coughs> 
to the yield capacity, right? But of course, the physical meaning is that this is the section modulus in this context. Good. Then uh, I go around and try to look over your shoulders. And you can have uh, also individual questions to me. So, so mal. So mal. Ich, äh <lacht> ja, gut, ich, ich habe ein System, System, Systemblind. Ne? Ich habe das macht es auch in der Vorlesung. Das also wird man ein bisschen Systemblind. Ich habe irgendwas vergessen zu sagen. Irgendwas zu schnell erklärt. Nö, nö, war sehr gut. Ich meine, das kann ja mal machen, dann kommt man nicht naja. Aber ich denke, naja. ich habe jetzt wirklich immer nur mit einem Wort zugehört, weil äh, das ist ja nicht ganz klar, was ich jetzt schwöre. Äh, Sollen jetzt nur das a priori Problem lösen? Oder? Erstmal, ja. Als erste Stufe, dann präsentiere ich das Res äh, Resultat. Ja. Und? Can we define, for example, this Function, uh, through the Monte Carlo analysis? No, you don't have to, Monte Carlo. Yes. But uh, I, can, I can show you how to calculate this very in, in easy terms. The beta. You, you use the Cornell reliability index? R minus S? No? No. No. Okay. I will explain. Okay, I just realized that there's a further hint needed. So how, how do we find, uh, so, so there was a question from one group whether it's a good idea to use Monte Carlo simulation for the uh, probability of failure. Um, this is always, Monte Carlo is always possible, eh? it's always a good choice. Eh? But in this, in this it's a little bit an overkill, right? Because what, what we get here, we can actually calculate this better as the as the difference between the mean value of R times W minus the mean value of Q. And here we have the square root of the standard deviation of uh, R squared times the W squared plus the standard deviation of Q squared. So this is the beta, and then uh, the probability of failure <laughs> is equal to the standard normal operator of minus beta. And that's uh, the smarter, smarter solution for the failure probability. Yeah you, yeah, you don't need it. You don't need that directly. What you, what you need is only this here. You, you only need this. So the, the cost of steel is actually not directly relevant. It's just to give you the feeling that we are talking about real numbers, right? So what you need is the C, C1 here. Oh, that because it's the expectation, that's the risk. <laughs> the construct, so, so I, I explain it again. So I, had, I received a question several times about this construction cost. Uh, so this term, this is just uh, the same than that one, right? And the reason we multiply it by failure is that uh, we consider the entire part here in the, in the brackets being the failure cost. Uh, so if we have failure, we want to reconstruct the structure. So we have to invest or implement the same design as before. That's the reason. So here, this is just C0 plus C1 times W plus H. Yeah. Should, we, uh, should we observe uh, section modulus as a variable or as a constant? No, that's your decision variable. This, yeah, so the section, you want to, you want to okay, find the uh, optimal choice of the section modulus. Yeah, but uh, do we need to take it as a stochastic variable with distribution? No, no, that's something you, you make no. the parameter study ab ab about. Okay, so, 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 so for, the for start we say it's a constant, because if it's like that then we can solve this manually in Epsilon. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you look at as a, as, a, as only absolute value. Yeah, yeah, of course. But then, okay. then, then in Excel you would just uh, look at thousands of different yeah, okay. Okay. W's, okay. and okay. then you look which opt which minimizes the which expected. Minimizes the, yeah. This, this yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Ja. Ja. Und? Hä? Das ist eine Einheiten, Einheitengruppe. Ich habe gemacht. Da fehlt noch was. Ja? CI ist gegeben pro Kubikmillimeter. Ne, das, das, das musst du einfach multiplizieren. Das multiplizierst du ja mit, äh, mit, mit äh, W. Ja gut, es kommt auch an, in was für einen Bereich von W du suchst, ne? Ich war doch F, 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 Ja. Ja, aber das ist irgendwie... Das ist ein Ja, aber, ja, aber das ist Größenordnung, was weiß ich, 10 Millionen oder so. Ne? Ja, der Startwert ist viel zu klein, ja. Ich kann jetzt das Ergebnis sagen. Okay, here, who is coming close? So the, 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 first, the first step is uh, maybe... Uh, When I refer when I refer to the to the lecture notes I wrote. So the, the, the first step might be to establish this uh, functional relationship between the failure probability and the decision variable, right? So here W is considered as the decision variable, and here you get also uh, uh, an idea, so it's measured in millimeter uh, cubic, and it has very, very high numbers, right? So you, you search for something that is, has the order of magnitude of 3 million. But then you can, you can uh, relate the choice of W to uh, system performance or to the probability of failure in this case. The beta index and the probability of failure in absolute terms. So that's something you establish uh, by using this beta formula. Right? Oder in einen Parameter und wir haben dann Beobachtungen auf einen von diesen Parametern von dieser Schädigungsfunktion. Ja, genau. genau. Also sonst, äh Können wir gleich mal beim Mittagessen setzen und zusammen diskutieren lassen. Genau. Also wäre schon schön, wenn wir das ein bisschen weiterführen könnten. Ne? Oh ja, das äh, müssen wir machen. Also das ist äh, das, das, das beste Weg gewesen, wie es ja bei der Wohnung nicht geklappt hat, aber das beste ja, also Weg ist, wenn wir da ein paar. Äh, ja, aber das ist ja jetzt ein ultra einfaches, <lacht> ultra einfaches Beispiel, und die haben da schon Probleme mit. Ne? Also das ist nicht so tiefes Niveau. Nee, nee. Die haben ja schon ein Problem, das einfach zu implementieren. Nein, die fragen mich, was eine Normalverteilung ja. im MATLAB das Kommando ist und so. Ja, ja. Nein, nein. Ja. 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 Das ist ja alle mehr gewesen, wenn wir da vorher ein paar Wochen Zeit gehabt hätten. Ja, natürlich, aber ich hatte Deadlines und alles mögliche, ja. ja, wie es halt so ist. Aber äh, wir können es ja, äh, wir kommen jetzt hier schon irgendwie durch. Äh, das machen wir. Aber wenn wir das, äh, das uns die nächsten Jahre vornehmen, ja. und das ein bisschen weiterentwickeln. Ja. Und wir könnten das versuchen, auch das Beispiel in diese JCCS Guideline zu überführen. Ja, ja. Als ja. das Principal Example. Ja, ja. Ich mache das auch in meiner Vorlesung. Ja. Das habe ich jetzt gest gestern habe ich das gemacht. Das ist praktisch, ich habe noch nicht so viel mit Bayesian Statistik in meiner Vorlesung, aber das ist ja das ist relativ straightforward. Ne? Also, ich, ich finde es gut. Mhm. Ich habe mir das jetzt für diese Ray of Information Sachen immer gespart. Ich habe das Design der Target Libraries gemacht. Ja, ja. Also ich finde es richtig gut. Mhm. Und ich wäre sehr interessiert, da gemeinsam ja, ja. zu arbeiten. Ja, ja. Und dass wir das für zukünftige Trainingskurs haben. Und ja. Und das JCS Dokument. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Yes. Ja. Yeah. Normal distribution with a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. But if you don't, if you leave this open, then this is the default. Okay, but uh, how can it calculate the probability of failure based on beta? You give in beta. So it's the normal of beta. Uh, 
So it's with it's so what, what? Uh, in beta as the input term. Yeah. It, contains, it contains all the mean. Uh, yeah, so as I wrote here, so the probability okay. of failure uh, is this phi yeah. of minus beta. Yeah. Okay. Of minus beta. Yeah, okay, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I also had some questions. Um, so this is the standard normal operator. It's the standard normal operator. This is just a normal distribution with a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. And when we take minus beta of this standard normal distribution, then we get the failure probability. And the failure probability we need uh, because it's a part of this objective function. And Jorge. <coughs> Works? Yes. Very good. So the result, the result should look like this. Maybe you pay uh, two minutes of attention. I can introduce the result to you. So here we have the decision variable and the red line, that's the expected cost that is somehow matching to this choice of the, of the section modulus. You see if you have a section modulus, uh, if you choose a section modulus in this domain, then the expected cost is high. If we choose one in this domain, the, uh, the costs are also high. Yeah, that we can clear later. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So this is one parameter. This is different. Yeah. So if you have twenty, then you get a slightly different result. But once you have coded it, then uh, you get uh, something like this. Sorry for that. It was obviously too late. Um, <coughs> So maybe we, uh, we agree on 40. I will change this also in the script. But this is just one parameter you have to change. So what we see here when you did not have uh, on such a core of curve before, we, say we see different domains uh, dependent on how we choose W, how we choose our design. And this side is dominated by the risk. And this side is dominated by the cost of additional material. Huh? So if we choose more W, uh, then we get higher costs because the material comes at the cost, the W comes at the cost. And it's a very, very typical shape of this curve that uh, the right-hand branch is so flat because this is dominated only by the construction cost. And the, the left side is rather steep because this is dominated by uh, the risk. And when we want to be in, uh, in the minimum, then uh, we are here. So here you see indicated the light lines. This is the risk part of the objective function. So this is the expected uh, uh, failure cost. And this is the construction cost part. And uh, the total cost curve is just uh, coming from the risk side and going uh, smoothly towards the uh, construction cost side. So this is an optimal design we can, uh, we can obtain. Note that, uh, as Danny mentioned, uh, this is now 40 instead of 20, but this is just one number you have to change. Otherwise, I believe uh, the numbers are consistent. What we get as a, as, a, as a cost, that will be interesting now in the further procedure of this task, the cost is somehow specified as uh, 133,914 Norwegian krona. So that's the minimal cost we can obtain. This is the absolute minimum we can get. And what we also get is an optimal beta index and the optimal failure probability. And as we have given the, uh, the load effect as a maximum of a 50-year period, also the failure probability and the beta index is associated to this 50-year reference period. And this is, of course, now a value we can discuss. Normally, 
when we don't do a risk-based design, when we do a reliability-based design, we only want to attain a design that uh, satisfied a certain reliability criteria. In this uh, example, we let this open, and the reliability or the failure probability comes just as a side, as a side uh, information from our optimization. But of course, what we always should do, uh, we should reflect this number, whether it's in a domain of something that we are used to, right? So if this would be an extremely low number in terms of the beta index or a very high failure probability compared of what we are normally doing, uh, then we should critically assess the boundary conditions, uh, whether we uh, did address the consequences uh, correctly. But uh, uh, a full risk-based uh, optimization is, uh, is also we have to make a lot of assumptions, is the most consistent uh, decision support we can get for a structural design. Because it only depends, not only only depends on the functional relationship between the decision variable, the design variable, and the failure probability, it actually only depends on the derivative of it. It only depends on the, on the gradient, how we can change the failure probability by changing uh, the design variable. And that makes this uh, analysis very strong and very insensible uh, against some, uh, uh, some cross errors we can do. For instance, we can neglect cross human error in design. And as uh, long as we uh, argue that this cross human error uh, the probability of fail or the probability of failure due to cross human error cannot be controlled sufficiently good by a marginal change in the decision variable and this is maybe an assumption which is somehow valid and uh, then this is uh, totally insensitive uh, to the fact that we did not consider this because it's only somehow evaluating our marginal change of failure probability by marginal change of the design variable so now you can work another five minutes in order to reach this, and then we continue to, ta to task two. So if you have some specific question, I will go around and try to answer them. So just another five to 10 minutes to come to this point, and then we continu continue and look how additional data might affect the result. Stimmt dann? Aber die Dummen sind nicht die gleichen zu sein die da auch stehen, aber irgendwie habe ich trotzdem, also es kommt vielleicht anders vor, nicht, nicht fast das gleiche, aber nicht ganz so schnell. Ja. Aber ich habe jetzt auch dieses gleiche, was da steht, 7,9 mal 10, 10, das ist das gleiche, 10.000, wenn das das gleiche ist, das ist ein komisch. Ich habe ich hab, ich hab, ich hab einen ähnlich einfachen Code, den können wir vielleicht noch einfach mal vergleichen. Ich habe das bedingt, also ich habe ihn vergangen, dass ich hier im Bild bin, dass du eine andere Zahl hast hier. Ja, ich kann, ich kann, ja gut, jetzt ist mein Computer da angeschlossen, ich kann, wir können nachher mal gucken. Ja, ja. Das sollte eigentlich schon stimmen. Ja, ich habe dann eben irgendwann auch mal rumgespielt und habe geguckt, dass ich da eine schöne Kurve hinkriege. Das war vielleicht, habe ich dann vielleicht nicht ganz äh, aufdatiert. Naja, so. Hm? Das sieht ja immer so aus, ne? Immer so aus, ja. Ich weiß ja auch, dass ich diese Simulationier tut, ne? Ja, 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 und das ist gar nicht so schlecht. Das ist Robust. Das ist gar nicht schlecht, ne? Das ist Robust. Ja. Also, wenn man natürlich natürlich die Unsicherheit gibt, ne? Ja, ja. Die jetzt hier nicht drin sind, dann sollte ich ja weiter nach rechts gehen, weil... Ja, ja, ja. Naja, das Problem ist, dass man nie weiß, wie weit man da ist. Na klar, weil ich meine, wenn ich mich nicht weit, wenn ich da ist... Na, ich kann das auch noch diskutieren. Ich, ich denke, ich denk, ich denk bei einer... Geht es vielleicht hier zu weit? Ja, 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 ja. Es wäre interessant, darüber zu reden. Aber ich, ich denke, ich denk, wenn, wenn du eine Entscheidungssituation anguckst, dann ist es eigentlich immer rational, ein bisschen darüber zu gehen. Aber das Problem ist, dass wir halt Tausende oder Millionen gleichzeitig betrachten. Und dass wir auch gar nicht wissen, wie weit wir da drüben sind. Wenn es zum Beispiel bei, einer, bei einem Assessment von, von einer existierenden Struktur da haben wir eben das Problem, dass, wir, dass, wir, dass, die, dass das erstens steiler wird. Das kostet mehr, die Sicherheit zu machen. Und dann haben wir nicht begrenzte Ressourcen. Und dann wird es schon aktuell. Ja. Ja, ja. ja. 
steel, you don't use it because you will use it later or because it's Pardon? intrinsic? The cost of steel, you don't use it because Maybe it's don't part use of it. the indirect? Yeah, 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 I've, I've, I've made this up. Yeah. yeah. Pardon? The R, yield strength of steel. Yeah. But it should be in newtons by millimeter square. Square, yeah, that's the printing. Ah, yeah. So that's where our conversion point is. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's 40 megapascals. It should be R. Yeah. Okay. And very close to the minimum. The standard deviation is 40 megapascals. The standard deviation, yeah. Yeah. 400, 400 yeah. Yeah, another, another printing error, I'm sorry for this. This is Newton per square millimeter. This is mega, mega Pascal, right? So, folks, uh, listen. Um, there will be a lunch break at 12 o'clock. And uh, you are very welcome to come directly after you have eaten something and work further on this example. But before that, uh, I, spent, uh, I want to spend the last 10 minutes to introduce uh, to task number two. Uh, task number two, as you remember, is uh, uh, how does this optimization change when we have additional data, when we have additional observations on the yield strength of the steel, right? And uh, that means that we have to um, formulate our uh, probabilistic model about the steel yield strength uh, in order that it somehow can accommodate for new information. So, so far we looked at uh, steel strength as a normal distributed variable with a mean value of 400 megapascal and a standard deviation of 40 megapascal, right? So now when we develop this example further, we consider this property of the steel, this distribution of the steel as the property of the cross supply of steel. That's actually what is generally done. So this is the property of a steel. This somehow maps your uncertainty about the steel strength when you know that it's just steel of a certain grade that comes from the market. So it's coming from the cross supply of steel. So then we, we look at a probability density function of the steel yield capacity, call it R in this example, uh, that might look like, like this, right? Normal distributed. So now we consider uh, that actually the steel property when it comes from a certain producer has a much less variability. And that's actually what you, what you observe also in reality. So when we get, when we analyze the different batches that come from different producers, we realize that in each batch we have much less variability than when we look at the cross supply. And that might look, when we, when we want to express it in terms of uh, probability density functions, that might look like this. Do you agree? So the Probability, or the probability density function of a certain batch that we get from a certain producer is much narrower uh, than the probability distribution uh, of uh, the cross supply. So now we have always in decision making we have to map our state of knowledge, knowledge in, uh, into our probabilistic models. And if our state of knowledge is that we take any steel that is available on the market, and we want to express our uncertainty about this steel property, we have to use the probability distribution of the cross supply, right? But we have a chance to learn more about the properties of the individual batch we are looking at because we get the, in one point in time, we get delivered all the steel from one batch, right? On our construction site. So we, can, we have the possibility to learn more about the uh, probability distribution of this particular batch by doing additional tests, right? So actually the situation is for our beam example that we are in either of these uh, distributions, but we don't know in which 
that's what happens. We just don't know which because we did not specify. We did not look. We just say we want to have steel from the market. And now for using this new information we can, we can actually learn more about and we can uh, know better to which of these uh, sub-populations uh, are, are, uh, our steel is coming from. And that we do by uh, considering this additional data. So we can have these observations and then we can update the black line which is the uh, distribution of the cross supply uh, by uh, accommodating for this information. And what, what we use uh, in this example is we consider a normal distribution with a known with known standard deviation and uncertain mean or unknown mean. And that's exactly what is more or less uh, indicated by these red lines. So we know that a typical batch, when we know from which batch we are talking about, a typical batch has a variability, but we don't know where, where is the mean value. So we see that these different batches all have different mean values, but they are uh, relatively stable when it comes to the to the standard deviation. And then we can actually uh, do some Bayesian updating and in the end of the document I distributed you have some general formulations for Bayesian updating uh, but for this case, for this special case of a normal distribution with a known uh, sigma, with a known standard deviation, we have very very compact analytical solutions for this Bayesian updating which we now utilize for our uh, indicative example. So uh, actually for introducing that I swapped to the document I, dis I distributed and you are welcome to have a look on it after the lunch break. So this is the curve and now we go uh, design after additional tests. That's what we are doing. So if you look here on the on the slide. Uh, the idea of having this uh, single batch uh, thing and this hierarchical um, organization of uncertainty in steel strengths is described in this text. And what we now assume is that uh, the standard deviation of a batch, which we're supposed to know, is 20 megapascal. And now the, the parameters we had before in our, in our uh, example somehow representing, representing the, the cross supply was uh, 400 in mean and uh, 40 in standard deviation and now in order to be, to be consistent uh, with this model here and with this new information that, uh, that the batch has uh, a 20 megapascal of standard deviation uh, we can calculate uh, what is the standard deviation of the mean because the mean value we consider now as being normal distributed with a mean value uh, which is uh, mu prime and the standard deviation which is uh, uh, sigma prime. So we have the red curves with, with a constant uh, standard deviation of 20 megapascal but we are not sure about the mean. And the mean value follows also a normal distribution with a mean value of uh, mu prime and a standard deviation of uh, sigma prime. So it's this uh, with a constant standard deviation distribution with an uncertain mean. We are not certain where we are, right? And in order to be consistent with the model we had before, we can uh, specify that uh, the, the mean value of the mean is of course the same value than we had before. It's the 400 megapascal, it's the mean of the mean. But the standard deviation of the mean uh, we can calculate as I said in order to be consistent uh, with the values we used before uh, to be uh, 34.64. So that's the standard deviation of the mean. That's this value here. 
and then we can incorporate this uh, uh, new information and this new information uh, that is enclosed uh, to the data and that is used in updating actually only refers or is translated into the number of observations so this is one piece of information we use from this data the number of observations and the mean value of these observations only these two pieces of information we use so you have the data, you have the, 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 five, uh, the five observations and we somehow catalyze this in only the number of observations and the mean value of the observations so why don't we consider the standard deviation of the observations? Exactly. Say it louder. It's already known. It's assumed to be known. It's assumed. So it makes no sense. So we assume to know the standard deviation. We don't have to evaluate it even because we assume to know it. Of course, when we are critical, we would do it and then maybe we would be a little bit cautious when we would see that it's totally different of our known assumption. Uh, but in this principle, when we are in this framework and we assume that we know the standard deviation, the information of the new data comes only with the number of observations and the mean value. And that's interesting because it's not so much information from this additional data, right? Okay, so how do we incorporate uh, this uh, new information here, this n equal to 5 and the x bar equal to uh, 394.2? So these are incorporated by, uh, by this uh, standard uh, solutions we have uh, for uh, this special case of a normal distribution with a, knee, uh, with a, mean, uh, with a known standard deviation and the unknown mean. So we uh, introduce first n prime and this can be uh, translated in the information weight of our prior. And this n prime is uh, simply the square root of uh, the standard deviation of a single batch divided by uh, the standard deviation of, uh, of my prior uh, mean value. So this is actually, when you remember the numbers, it's 20 divided by 36 point so, right? Uh, and that gets, uh, gets a number of uh, 0 0.5774. And that's n prime. And that can be, as I said, it's the weight of the prior uh, distribution. And you, to get a feeling in your fingertips, you can even say the information I have, the prior information I have, does correspond to n prime number of observations. So the information I have prior is actually very, very weak. It's very, uh, it contains not much information. It corresponds to a less to less than one observation, right? So it's in a, in a, in a way very non-informative. And this always already gives us an idea that uh, the information weight of the new information, which is five, will have a strong will have, will have a strong effect in the updating, right? So n prime is the uh, is an informative value uh, for the information weight of your prior information. And then you can uh, get the posterior parameters of the mean value of R and R itself. So you remember, you remember the mean value of R was uncertain and represented by a normal distributed random variable with a mean value in the standard deviation, mu prime and uh, sigma prime. And now we can incorporate the new information and we come to a mu 2 prime and a sigma 2 prime. And these are then the posterior uh, parameters that already take into account this uh, information. So we, we go from, uh, from uh, mu prime and uh, sigma prime that is incorporated here. Uh, we go to uh, mu two prime and uh, sigma two prime. And we use this uh, as standard solutions for this case of the normal distribution with a known standard deviation. This is actually a very convenient result, even the formula looks a little bit tricky to you. But compared to what you find else or compared of that kind of integrals you have to solve, we will look later, later in this course how complicated this can get. But this is a very, very nice and convenient uh, solution that stems, of course, uh, on this uh, very simplifying assumptions. So we can get the posterior parameters of the mean value 
and correspondingly we can get the posterior uh, parameter uh, of, the, of the material property itself. So we have a mean value conditional on the observations and we have a representation of the uh, physical variable, the yield steel capacity conditional on the observations. And this is just now the normal distribution with the mean value that is evalu evaluated here and the standard deviation that is evaluated here. So this gives new values. So we, have, we, we actually use this and this and when you have succeeded with the first task you already have your your program, your file, your M file or your function that calculates this. You save this to another name and you just, ch you just change the, uh, the parameters to these two of R. And of course, if you are interested, you also incorporate this uh, simple Bayesian updating with the formulas and with the data, then it makes it a little bit more generic. And then uh, we should come to a, to a result. Yes? The definition of the prior rate, is it with the variance uh, ratio or with the standard deviation ratio? Because uh, the value you give uh, is obtained if you do the standard deviation uh, ratio. Okay, so maybe I did a mistake. So it's the variance ratio. If you do this variance as you're doing there, mm -hmm. uh, it's 0 0.33. Okay. And if you do sigma over sigma, then it's done. Yeah, I have to check. But then you get uh, this kind of result. So you have the gray. You have the gray curve. That was the old result. That was the old optimum. And now we get uh, we get the blue one, which is the new result. And what we see is that uh, we have to use less W because yeah. A conditional of what we learned about the structure. That's not surprising because we reduced the uncertainty. And also uh, the corresponding uh, failure probability and the uh, better index, the failure probability is actually going down. Which can also be explained that we learn more about uh, the structure. And as we have learned more about the structure, it's also possible to find uh, expected cost that is lower than before. Right? So by learning more about the structure, by having these additional tests, the, the minimum, minimum expected costs is getting lower. Yes? That beta value could have easily gone up, right? Depending on the kind of data set that we get. Pardon? That beta value yeah. could have easily gone up, depending upon the observations that we make. <laughs> Yeah. Right. In that case, our posterior costs or whatever we call them would have been higher. The better value goes up. It does go up. It goes up, yeah. Uh, 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 sorry, I mean the probability of failure would could easily go up. Due to the observations. Because of the observations, right? Yeah, you you could think about when you make when you make suddenly observations here. You can have the, but in average, that we, that's what we look uh, then later on for the pre-posteriori. In average, it will go. Information does help, right? In average, information does not harm. That's uh, maybe a general grandfather statement. Uh, but of course, you can have certain types of information that somehow uh, that somehow uh, indicate that you are more or less on the far side of uh, prior distribution, and then uh, of course uh, the. The costs can also go up, but uh, it's a little bit about the average tendency. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The spread reduces when you have more information yeah, and then have less uncertainty. On an average. Mm -hmm. On an average, the spread reduces. Well, the spread always reduces. It's only dependent whether your location uh, is uh, still stable. Yeah.
you can have the situation that your that your variability is reducing, but your location is moving so so much to the weak side that actually your failure probability goes uh, goes up. So That's so possible. So is it because of the way we are uh, sampling the observations that our posterior costs usually go down? Is it because of the way we are sampling? Because let's say if the instrument was uh, biased, mm -hmm. it had some biases. Mm -hmm. So there would be a very significant shift in the central tendency of the observation that we get. Mm -hmm. And in that case, uh, it could be negative, right? I mean, it could be. Now if you don't know the bias. So do you consider to know the bias or don't, don't you know the bias? If you know the bias, you can take this into account, right? But if you, if you don't know the bias, then you should at least uh, consider this uh, as a, a part of your uncertainty, right? Uncertainty always uh, having a part of this random scatter and also the unknown uh, systematic error we are doing, right? But uh, any questions so far? So otherwise we can uh, go for lunch and you can work further on this afterwards. I have to clarify something with this weight. So yeah. Yeah, that, that comes in the third part. So now we, we take these experiments for granted and we check what is the effect of these experiments. And we see that these experiments already have an effect on the expected cost. They make the expected costs lower because we have less uncertainty. Yeah. And now the next step will be that we, we, we put some costs, how, what is the cost of each experiment? And then we can actually find out what is the optimal number of experiments we can do. That's, that's to what we do after lunch. Good? Lunch? Good, if you have some specific questions uh, that might help to implement these two tasks, uh, you might raise your hand, I can come by. Okay, I see that you somehow work on your own and doesn't, do not have so many questions, so maybe we just go further. I discuss a little bit with you these results. You are uh, uh, intended to also get uh, with a little bit more time and then we go further and we do uh, the step to the pre-posterior analysis. But here this is the posterior analysis so um, the gray cycle indicates the optimum as we have it identified based on the prior information on the yield strength. Then we got the five additional observations on the yield strength and we get uh, the so-called uh, conditional, optimum conditional on this data. And as we see, the choice of W goes down, but at the same time, uh, the reliability goes up. So actually, what we do is we find an optimum that is a little bit uh, smaller section modulus, but at the same time, this smaller section modulus uh, does give us a higher reliability. And that points to the fact that the reliability we calculate is entirely conditional on our information we have, right? So it's actually expre expressing our belief about uh, the uh, likelihood of failure. But also, and that's important when uh, we want to bring it down to value of information later on, what we also see is that we have a slightly uh, different minimum expected cost. So the, min uh, the, expect the minimum expected cost given the data is 222,239 uh, Norwegian kroner uh, before it was uh, 223 914,000. So the price went down. And now in the, in the uh, retro perspective, we can already see whether this difference here, the price difference, is somehow in correspondence with, with what we have invested into these additional results, right? How, how costly was it to obtain this additional data? But of course, afterwards, we can only say it was worthwhile or not. 
but we already have invested in the data. We have used the data for our analysis, and it's just informative to see whether this was efficient or not, right? What we can now do in the pre-posteriori analysis is we can analyze beforehand what the expected effect of new observations will be, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, stop here. Let's stop, close half your computer and pay attention. Huh? So we, uh, we now continue uh, closing up uh, this example. I think, I hope you are all in a, in a good way uh, to come towards this result. But now let's uh, introduce the, the last step uh, of, a, of a formal uh, decision analysis and that would be uh, not a decision what is the right thing to do in terms of a physical change of the system like uh, changing the W of the beam. Now we uh, formulate the decision on uh, what should I know or what is optimal to be known, right? And as we, as we can say, uh, in principle information never hurts, so when information comes at no cost, it's of, all, of course always good to have more information. But normally the information comes at the cost and uh, we can actually formulate an optimum that weights or balances the investment into more information uh, with the outcomes of our expected consequences we have as a consequence of paying money for the experiments but also suffering uh, from the consequences of failure and also suffering uh, from the consequences of having a a physical solution that is actually too big because we did not have enough information for finding a more sensible choice, right? So uh, we uh, can plan experiments, we can actually plan how many experiments we should do and this is done by this uh, pre-posterior analys analysis and here the expected effect of additional experiments uh, on the total expected benefit can be uh, analyzed. And here it's important to highlight that we look at the expected uh, effect of this information because we have not observed this information. So we can also only treat the expected effect of the information uh, on, on a change uh, of the decision. So uh, what we can do is we uh, can um, uh, look at our solutions for the posterior uh, parameters of the physical uh, value uh, are the yield strengths and uh, what we can say is that uh, we observe that the, um, the standard deviation of the yield strengths is already a function of the number of experiments independent of what we observe. Right? So when we look at this formula and this is exactly the same as we used in the posterior analysis here we see that we have n and when we increase n, what happens with the standard deviation? It decreases. Huh? So by having more observations, we can decrease the standard deviation of uh, the yield strengths. That's good. Right? And actually nothing else is contained here that could be described as an attribute of the experiments. So the only attribute of the additional experiments we do is the number of the experiments in this part of the equation. It looks a little bit different if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, a posterior mean. There, of course, uh, we, we have a mean of the observations, right? So in the original formula, when we looked at the posterior uh, mean value here, it looked like this. We have the sample mean. That's the information content of our new data set. But now we want to look what is the effect, the expected effect of a future new data set. So the only thing that we can do, what would the mean be? What we expect the mean to be of the data set? We expect this mean to be the same as our prior, right? And that's ex exactly what we do in a more complex decision analysis. We use the prior information in order to uh, get an idea what the experiments could be, right? So here we take the prior mean, we take the prior mean in order 
to find out what would we expect this future mean value of the experiments will be, right? And therefore, in the formula below, we use this uh, mu prime, which is the prior mean of the mean. We use this uh, two times, and then uh, everything cancels out, and we just say that uh, uh, the mean two prime, the posterior mean, is actually the same as the prior mean. Because that's our expectation of these new experiments. So actually, we can use this two now in order to make uh, our analysis. And now we want to express the functional relationship, for instance, of the failure probability or of the beta index by increasing number of observations. Right? And this is, before we go into the optimization, this is what we, what we do here. So here we have the number of observations. And this is the effect on the reliability index, and this is the effect uh, on the failure, uh, on the expected cost. So the expected cost goes down dramatically with uh, the number of experiments. So if the experiments would come at no cost, uh, there's nothing against to argue that we should make a lot of experiments, right? And then we would some way converge to the situation where we have an exact probabilistic description of a, of a sample, of a subset of this population so with, a, with a standard deviation of 20 megapascal. But as the, the experiments come at the cost, uh, we might also use this uh, relationship in order to find an optimum. So this is done uh, here in the text. You can read it in your document. So the optimal number of experiments can be identified by assuming a cost function for the experiments. Right? So now we want to uh, formulate what does it cost to get more experiments. So what is the cost as a function of n? And that, as we did before, we might argue that we have a, a fixed cost setting up the experimental campaign. So we might not start at uh, zero experiment zero, and one experiment is the cost of one experiment, but we have to establish an infrastructure for the experiments, right? We have a fixed cost, and that's here now uh, described as uh, the C experiment zero. It's now considered as just a number, 400 crones. That's not so much, that's 40 euros. It's just to mention a number, a very cheap test. And then each single experiment has the cost of 20 Norwegian kroner. It's two euros. So that's the cost of each additional test. So one test will come at uh, 420, two tests at 440, and so forth, right? So now this component we add to our total cost as a, as a function of n. So this was, the, this was uh, what we already had here. And now we, we just uh, uh, consider uh, additional the experimental costs. And then we, get, then we get something like that that looks more or less like the optimization curve before. But now it's not the decision about uh, physical change of the beam. It's not a decision about W. It's actually the decision about N, number of experiments. And as we see, for the given cost function, and of course we can dispute uh, what would be the cost of real experiments. Maybe they are much more expensive than the optimum goes in that direction, right? But we see that uh, with, the, with, the, with the current assumption, the optimal number of experiments is five. So when we would have six experiments, we would get more information, we would get a little bit less uncertainty but we also would have to pay 20 Norwegian kroner more compared to five experiments. And that difference always uh, makes the uh, uh, solution or the decision for six experiments or for seven a uh, little bit less optimal uh, than for five. So now we have the optimal number uh, of experiments for this example. Yeah? yeah so um, any number below five is pretty much not acceptable for the number of experiments because that, should, that would be the risk region. Like say two experiments, it's the cost corresponding to that is quite high. Yeah, but uh, but you should now you should not make the mistake to say that this is really risky, 
this is just this is just meaning uh, this is just meaning that uh, that we are a little bit less optimal, right? So no experiments that was in this uh, n optimization curve far up. It's just uh, it's just this situation. So we are not in uh, terms that we risk our lives when we don't do any experiments. So uh, the scale is a little bit different. But of course we see that uh, experiments have a very, very large effect, uh, especially in the beginning, right? And that's of course totally triggered by our assumption that we have this cross supply with a relatively large variation. And then we say this cross supply consists of sub supplies that have a relatively low uh, variation. That makes the, uh, the prior a scatter of the mean value pretty wide and that makes the value of information getting more experiments pretty high. So everything is somehow uh, connecting to each other. But, uh, but the idea of this example and of course if you have a nice and clean way to program it you can also make parameter studies on the different inputs. So you, you see you get a feeling what value of information is about. When you, for instance, uh, change the weight of your prior information, this would be this n prime, where I had this uh, little error, which is 0 0.33. It's a very low information content of the prior. But if this information content of the prior is much larger, then the effect of the new uh, tests on the optimum is less. And then uh, maybe it would look entirely different. And given, and given uh, I actually played a little bit around with the numbers, right? And even with this, very, very uh, uninformative or relatively non-informative prior where uh, from, from the onset of the problem the new information should have always have a big effect. Uh, when we get uh, with the exp uh, cost of experiments to a rather large C0 of experiments, which is the establishment of an experimental campaign in a real project, this is quite a value, right? We maybe talk about 10,000 kroner, 1,000 10, euro or 10,000 euro. Then you come into, into a domain where you have to say, okay, it makes no sense at all to make experiments. Then the, the curve just, just goes up and the optimum is at zero. So, so this uh, gives you a feeling what is information about and what is an optimal uh, choice. And of course, I calibrated now all the boundary conditions that we have an uh, optimum at five, which is more or less some experiments, right? This is not, uh, but it, it, it will be never, and that's a general that also you can do when you much more st uh, uh, experimental planning on the much more statistical side. You, you hardly get uh, results where your optimal number of experiments is 200, right? Because it's the effect of new information, the difference between 119 and 120 uh, observations is very, very low. It's very marginally uh, affecting your problem. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the optimum value is at five. So is it uh, because we assume the, the mean value is the same for the following test result? Or yeah. Is it because the standard version we assume before, like that. So. And now, now we look at the expected effect of the experiments, and uh, the, the the best thing we can expect from our experiments is that these experiments behave as we uh, prior think. So the mean value would be there where we think it uh, will be uh, from our prior knowledge. So it has to be consistent with our prior uh, expectation, right? And of course, in reality, the mean value is different. But the best thing we can do before we do the experiments is that the mean value we expect the most is the mean value of the prior distribution. I mean, yeah. the optimum value that we found in five, is it by chance? Yeah, that's by chance. It's only a function of all these input variables. When we change, for instance, the costs, it might be four. When you, when you, for instance, increase, so this line here is triggered by the cost per experiment. So when you, when you have a larger cost per experiment, then your your optimum goes into that direction, right? So we might get four, four. So it's just that's just a function that maybe you may might. Well, I mean, it's by chance. It's just a function of our input. 
But in the idle world, in a serious project, we of course want to quantify our input uh, based on our best knowledge we have. And at least this decision framework is, uh, is a consistent framework where we have enough uh, interfaces where we can put information and our experience in, in order to give, give us a rational framework uh, for our reasoning. But of course, in a real project, we have to discuss what is the cost of the experiment and so forth. What is the prior estimate of the mean value and things like that. Mm. Yeah. Can we interpret this number of experiments as uh, the number of inspection that could be uh, performed during the life cycle of the structure, for example? Yeah. Yeah, in that case, how do we incorporate uh, uh, interest rates? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I forgot to... I forgot to mention. Uh, so this example is in a very uh, textbook example uh, as it is uh, somehow simplified. Not only in terms of uh, how we do the Bayesian updating, uh, but it's also simplified in terms of the objective function. And in the objective function, so when, we, when you do a serious uh, assessment, uh, then you have to uh, think about your total costs. But you have to think about that these costs in this objective function they take place at different points in time, right? So you have uh, the construction cost that obviously takes uh, place uh, pretty soon uh, after you take this decision. Uh, but then you have the failure costs uh, that take place in some future point in time. And now you have to uh, somehow build a net present value now because now you do the decision of the costs and expenditures you will have in the future. And that makes the problem a little bit more complicated. Right? And uh, when you think about an inspection problem, then you also really uh, seriously have to take into account how you can uh, um, uh, uh, project all these costs on the point in time uh, your decision takes place. And then interest uh, plays a big role. And uh, also the uncertainties uh, in the assumptions of interest rates uh, play, play a role and uh, sometimes a really big role uh, when it comes to the sensitivity to the decision. But this is simplified, this is not discussed now in this example. This would com com uh, make the problem more complicated. Yeah? So when we're talking about five inspections, five inspections taken at an instant of time, right? Pardon? What kind of inspections? Uh, when we're talking about five observations. Five observations, yeah. We're talking about five observations taken at a single instant of time. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, this is now the design phase, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we can draw some material tests during the design. And uh, tomorrow, I hope, we look at maybe the same structure and we in include some uh, degradation on R. And then we discuss uh, how can we learn about this degradation function. Uh, and then we maybe think also about a time sequence or something like that. But the principle remains the same, but uh, the technicalities, they become a little bit more complicated when we look at it over time. But also by inspections, we add information to the, to the system. And this information comes to a cost, and we might find, as we do here, an optimum between the, opt uh, the information that comes by a cost and the effect on our optimal solution. Hmm. And then, of course, in a practical uh, assessment situation, uh, we uh, maybe very often do, do not do that entirely risk-based. So maybe we want to be over a certain threshold in terms of uh, reliability. And then uh, this uh, gets also a little bit more different or different from that example. So here we have an uh, entirely risk-based uh, uh, consideration of the entire problem. So the failure probabilities as an output or outside of our problem setting, they don't play any role. It's about minimization of expected costs, and that's it. Yeah. So, in, in this case, this is more like a, a big distance of inspection? Oh. No, this would be uh, at a certain point in time you make a number of observations on your structure. Yes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Good. Then I suggest uh, you take a deep breath and uh, tonight uh, you of course don't go to the city uh, tour. Uh, you sit at home and look at it, stick this document and you implement an example if you did not have time for that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Not here for fun. You can do both. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. Five minutes and then... Uh, no, we just continue. We just continue, okay.